All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining again for another Bible study. Uh, this week, we're going to be starting a new series. Uh, we're going to go into the book of Ephesians, and it's a fantastic book written by Paul. Um, but before we go any further, I'd like you to go ahead and just pause the video for a moment and pray to the Lord and just pray for some wisdom and guidance in the words that we are about to read and understand. So go ahead and press pause now. All right, so we're back and we are now going to start with uh, the study. Um, we're going to be studying the book of Ephesians, uh, but before we get into that, I usually like to do a little bit of background on the context of the book, who it was written to, why it was written, and some things like that. So first of all, this book was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, and it was written to the Ephesians. Uh, that were, that these are Christians that were living in the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus was a rather large city, um, probably around a quarter of a million people, 250,000. So in the Roman um, land, it was probably one of the larger cities and this city of Ephesus is in, located in what we would now today call Turkey. Um, so we read a little bit. Uh, we know that Paul travels to Ephesus, and we can read about that in, in the book of Acts, chapter 19. You can go. With, you can read uh, his his trip there and what went on. If you want to go back and read that, that was great. Um, but we do know a few things about Ephesus. That it was a a city that was. Troubled with witchcraft, idolatry, uh, they worshipped, they were really into worshipping the false god of Artemis. Um, there was just a lot of witchcraft and a lot of bad things going on there. It was full of it. Um, so it was also famous for magic and sorcery, uh, you know, just a lot of things that you know, would really interfere with the Christian life. And so Paul was really intent on writing a letter to these Christians who were struggling with that time and the people around them and the rulers of the area that they lived in. Um, so just so you can get a glimpse of, of what a little bit about this letter says and how that would relate to the background of this city, um, if you read Ephesians chapter 6, 12 and 13, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. So this verse helps us to shine a little bit of light, as I said before, and to get a little bit of better understanding of what Paul's talking about, right? He's talking about the, the people in the area, the rulers, the evil things that are going on, and Paul's trying to encourage them to have the strength to to withstand and make it through all of this. Uh, so he wrote this letter in approximately 52 AD. Uh, he wrote it to the churches that are in Ephesus, and Paul wrote this letter while he himself was imprisoned. And Paul in this letter calls himself an apostle. And apostle basically just means one who is sent, uh, basically an ambassador. So we have ambassadors in other countries, and those ambassadors represent America in a foreign place. And so Paul was an apostle, and he used this letter to represent himself to the church in Ephesus as he was imprisoned. Um, let's see here. But you can take this book, basically, and break it down into two large categories, the first half and the second half. Now, the first four chapters, or maybe the first three chapters, um, Paul really focuses in on who God is and what he's done. Right? He really puts a lot of emphasis in God's power, God's love, and, and who he is and the things that he's done for us. And then the second half of the book kind of is more of a, well, since we know that, here's how we should live. Knowing who God is, knowing how powerful he is and how much he loves us and the great things that he's done. Now, here's kind of how we should react to that. Uh, and so that's just a little bit of a, a breakdown of the, the basics of the book of Ephesians. Sorry. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start reading. And I'll be starting reading in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will. To the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the God and the Father of 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. For he chose us in him before the foundation of this world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to his favor and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, that he favored us within the beloved. We have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he planned in him for the administration of the days of fulfillment to bring everything together in the Messiah, but both things in heaven and things on earth in him. We have also received an inheritance in him, predestined according to the purpose of the one who works out everything in agreement with the decision of his will, so that we who have already put our hope in the Messiah might bring praise to his glory. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession, the praise of his glory. So that's 1 through 14. Um, and it's, it's interesting here. We can kind of take this little section here of verses uh, 4 and 5. Let's start with verses 4 and 5. And I'm going to go ahead and go back here and skip to verses 4 and 5. But it says, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself according to his favor and will. Um, we all kind of can relate to back to elementary school or even in high school now where they will pick teams. Um, we all know that we don't like to be the last one left standing on the wall, uh, the one who doesn't get picked or the one who gets overlooked many times. Uh, none of us like that feeling. We don't like the rejection that comes along with that. But here's the deal. What, what Paul says here is that God chose us. God chose you, specifically you, to do things for him. To, he chose you to be on his team. Um, so that right there is a great statement of, of the love that he has, that he chose us. Um, and, you know, oftentimes we hear the phrase, we are to seek God. Seek out God. Seek out God's will. Yes, fantastic. But think of this. God has seeked you out personally. God has put time into looking into you and, and choosing you and seeking you out. And that should make you feel a little bit special. And if it doesn't, if that doesn't make the, the hair stand up on your arms a little bit, then, you know, I, I don't know what you're doing. But that's very important to understand. Now, there's two kind of ways that we can look at this word predestined. Um, many choose this one way and, and, and some will choose the other. But one will say that God had chosen out a group of people before time and no matter what they were going to be saved. Uh, others may say that God predestination means that we have just been chosen to be part of God's family. And, and I'm not going to tell you today what to believe. I know how I feel about it and I know what I, I believe, but I don't think that, that the important part of this is for you to, to grasp that. But what I believe is if you think about it, when it comes to heaven, I don't think God's going to be surprised who shows up someday. He's going to be like, oh, hey, Mick, you made it. No, right? I, I do believe that God already knows these things uh, in a way that's predestined. Um, so there's some different ideas of theology and, and things that go on there, and we're not going to dig too deep into that. I just want you to know that, that God has chosen you, and that's one of the main things that, that we should live our life by, understanding that the creator of everything, the creator of this world, chose you. And that means a lot. Um, now, let's move on here, and we're going to read verses 6 and 7. And the topic for these verses here is going to be uh, grace, redemption, and forgiveness. So let's look here, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. To the praise of his glorious grace that he favored us within the Beloved, we have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace. So... The only way that we could ever be made right was by God's grace, right? So 
first of all, we need to think about that. And, and we need to understand the fact of why does God, why do we need grace? Why do you think you need grace? Um, God is perfect, and we mess up. And so in a, in a manner, there has to be grace, right? Because if we, we could never live up to these perfect perfection standards that, that God has, right? We, no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, there's nothing in the world we could ever do. We could take all the good deeds we've ever had, stack them on top of each other, and it will never reach, reach perfection, right? And that's why we need grace. Uh, it's very important that we understand this grace because we don't deserve it. And, and that's what grace is, is, is giving something when you don't deserve it. You didn't work for it and you didn't earn it. It's just given to you even though you didn't do what was asked of you, right? That's kind of what grace is in a, in a short sense because we mess up and God, you know, he gives it to us. Um, so a couple things that teaches us about God, right? That teaches us, for one, that God is a very loving man, right? Or, or uh, he's very caring um, as a father. And I know you have parents as well. Uh, there's not always so much grace given. Uh, when my kids mess up, sometimes I can I can get mad or hold a grudge, and I'm sure your parents can do the same. Um, just imagine the worst thing that ever happened to you in the world by somebody else, and you just completely let it go and overlook it. That's grace, and so that's what God's done for us. Um, and another thing is is that it teaches us the value of what we are to God, right? If God cared so much that He He looks past all of these things. That means we're important, and, and that puts a lot of value on us. Um, so another thing that we can get from this is with grace, redemption, and forgiveness is that we need this from God because oftentimes in our world, and what Paul is writing to the, the people in Ephesus here, is that we often find other things to fill up our worthiness. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right words to say here. Um, but we look so often to things of the world to give us a higher standing. Um, so we often think that that next job or a raise or that college degree or, uh, you know, things like that are going to give us a higher stand level of standing. Um, and what Paul's writing here is no, 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 no. The only thing that you can ever do to receive a higher standing is accept the blood of Christ, the sacrifice that was given for us. And this relates to the, the uh, people in, Ephes in Ephesus because they've got so much going around, on around them and they're really struggling hard to live with their Christian beliefs and morals in this world. And so Paul is telling them, you don't need to be a powerful in their eyes. You don't need to have a, a good standing in their eyes. What you need to do is trust God's grace, God's forgiveness, and God's redemption, right? God has redeemed us through what he's done. And that gives us a better standing than anything on this earth could ever give us. So what God, or what Paul is wanting us to do here is not focus so much on the world and what the world can do and what we can do in this world more than what... God has done and God is doing for us and in us. I think that's uh, what Paul is really trying to get at here. Um, so, first of all, apart from God, if we were just to take this whole first section of, of what Paul is writing about, of who God is and who, what God is, let's just take that all out for a second and then put us there. What are we apart from God? And just think about that for a minute. What are you apart from God? Well, you may feel like you do good things, you may feel like you're a nice person, but it doesn't stack up, like I said before. Uh, apart from God, we are nothing. We are, we are hopeless. We are worthless. We are just, uh, for lack of better, better words, uh, dust in the wind. We are just here one day and gone the next. So that is very important, that God sees us as valuable, God uses us, and God wants us to know how valuable we are to him. And apart from Christ's sacrifice, we, we have zero, zero forgiveness for anything we've ever done. So think of, of things you've done in the past um, that, you know, were wrong. There would never be any forgiveness for that. Uh, there would be no uh, hope for overcoming that. There's just no hope. It, it, what you are is what you've done. 
in that manner if, if it wasn't for Christ's sacrifice. All right, so now let's move on to verses 13 and 14 here. Um, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance for the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. So what we see here is, is we were sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a down payment. You know, when you go to buy a car and you go to a car lot, um, they just usually don't let you drive off without, without signing some papers and putting down a down payment. They want to have some trust that you're, you're in this, right? And the Holy Spirit for us, after we have chosen to follow Christ and made that public de declaration and then were baptized, you know, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's our down payment. That is the promise that God has made for us to to keep having, you know, hope in this future and what's going on. Um, so that's our assurance that God is going to make good on seeing us through his promise. As we know, God makes many promises. And as we know, God always keeps his promises. Even if we don't keep our end, he still keeps his promise. And he finds ways to to propitiate or to make okay, to to level out, to clear the, the, the mis the misguidings that we've done, the things that we've done wrong. Um, now, the next thing we need to look at here is inheritance. So what is inheritance, right? We think of inheritance as maybe your grandfather or your grandparents die and they leave you something in their will. You inherit this, right? So what is our inheritance? Paul tells us we have a great inheritance through him. Um, so it could be heaven, right? Heaven, that's one of the things. But I think it's a lot more than this. Um, our inheritance is, is our status of God's holy people. So since this has all happened now and we've accepted Christ, we have this inheritance of being his people. And if you read through the Old Testament and the Bible, God's people, it's a very, very big deal to be in that group. Um, and we get that one through the sacrifice of Christ. We get that inheritance. We become God's people. From the moment that we accept Christ and we make that heart decision, that, that real decision to follow him, we are now labeled as his people. That is huge. Um, let's keep going, and, and I'm going to read verses 15 through 23. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus uh, and your love for the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength. He demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand of the heavens, far above every ruler and every authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only this age, but also in the one to come. And he put everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. So we see Paul here, this is a prayer for the people in Ephesus, the people who are reading this letter, the, the Christians in Ephesus, he's praying for them. And, and his prayer includes uh, three things mainly. Uh, one is thanksgiving. Right? He's giving thanks that these people have the love for the saints. He's, he's praying thanksgiving for them. Um, he's grateful for the things that they're doing and, and who they are and the, the faith that they have uh, enduring through the trials. Um, another thing he prays for them is for a spirit of wisdom. He prays that they would have the ability to understand what God's will is through them, each one of them, that they would be able to live out um, what God wants them to do. And that's an important prayer. If you want, want to pray for somebody, that's one great thing. Pray for me. It, it, pray for your parents that they would have a, a spirit of wisdom of what God wants them to do because that's that's a hard thing. We spend so much time in, in this world, as I'm sure that the, the Ephesians did as well, of, of trying to um, please the people around them and trying to please the society. Uh, we get caught up in that, but we only need to please God. And that's a very important thing to understand. And then the last thing that we see here is that God, or Paul, prays for them, for their eyes of their hearts to be opened so they can see what is really going on. 
we get blinded. Our, our heads are filled with so much every day, with, especially with the amount of social media and in, internet access that we have. You can't go anywhere without just ads and, and things just being filling our minds. Um, and we get clogged up. We get covered in, in all these worldly things. And we tend to fail to see what God is doing sometimes. And so that's kind of what Paul is praying here is that their, the eyes of their heart would be opened not to just what Paul is saying, but what to God is saying right, to, to what God is having them do as a church, as a people. Um, so in one nine, as we read a little bit earlier, um, Paul said God has made known to us the mystery of his will. And now what he's saying is that we can learn about God as Christians, and we need that wisdom though, right? But to, to learn about who we are now, God has made that mystery clear, but there's still more to learn. Right? And we need to have the eyes of our heart open so we can continue not to just help ourselves, but other Christians in the church and those around us, right? And so then the last thing that, that Paul focuses on here in verses 19 through 23, let's go ahead and read those real quick here. Um, well, is, is his power. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the work of his strength? He demonstrated this power in raising the Messiah from the dead. Um, so what does Paul really say that God did here to, to show his immeasurable power? Well, he raised Jesus from the dead. Um, there's no man in the world, there's nobody on this planet who can do such a thing. Uh, we may be able to prolong life with medical uh, and machines and things, but we cannot raise from the dead. Um, we cannot give life everlasting. And, and God has his power. That's, that's amazing. That's an immeasurable power. Um, so like I said, like we pretend to have power. We pretend that when you have this degree or you have um, this position that you have power, but it's meaningless. It really is because when you're gone, I'll tell you what, they're going to put the next person there. And they probably won't even remember you. Uh, so the power that we pretend to have is nothing compared to the power that God has. Uh, no matter what this world throws at us, even death, right, it cannot defeat this power that God has. Because God had raised Jesus from the dead, and it proves that. And that just shows us that, you know, we can have this great hope and this great faith. Um, so we're going we're gonna to close up here with just a few ways that maybe we can apply uh, this chapter one of Ephesians to our lives. Um, uh, one way that I think we can do that is just by stopping, slowing down, and, and thinking about it for a second. And, and it should give us hope to know that God chose us. Right? God chose you. God predestined you to do something. Every one of you. I don't care who you are, where you're at. Every single one of you have been chosen for something. Uh, and, and if we are filling our head with loud noise and things going on, we're never going to slow down and be quiet enough to hear what that is. Uh, so you've got you've to spend time meditating and focusing on God and, and what his plan is for you. Um, another thing that we can take here is, is think about yourself. We often get down on ourselves and we, we have low self-esteem. But if you could only see yourself through God's eyes for just a moment and uh, through the lenses of Jesus Christ, right? That should give you some confidence. And I'm not talking about boasting. I'm talking about confidence that uh, you are loved, that you are important, and you are here for a reason. Uh, I think that's one thing that we need to slow down and look at as well. And it also gives us hope to face whatever challenges we have. Knowing that God has this power, that God is there, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, as a down payment for eternity. Um, there's nothing that can really get in our way that should detour us. Uh, I mean, I know that there's certain points of every day where we get discouraged, but that uh, should go away very quickly after knowing what we know and having felt what we have felt and lived what we have lived and witnessed what we have witnessed. Um, and the last one, um, is just more of a question is is have you ever have you ever trusted the world more than you trusted God? And I think we're all guilty of this sometimes, but I think it's important that we say it out loud that you know 
but maybe we're putting too much trust in the things of this world. Uh, that's enough for today. Go ahead and uh, just think about that. Go back and read through Ephesians chapter 1 if you'd like. Uh, spend a little bit of time in prayer, and uh, I hope to see you all soon.